Um, I guess a little bit of way, uh, by way of background, I'm, I'm neither an educator uh, nor am I an academic. Uh, by and large, I've had two careers, uh, one in, in public service, concerned with uh, uh, analysis for public policy, basically, uh, and information to support that, uh, and a second career uh, that's now been 30 years uh, uh, as uh, uh, the founder of a small company, uh, grown to be now about 10 people, um, engaged in uh, systems modeling, so computer systems modeling. Uh, and I guess uh, uh, we, or I've certainly, from this experience, I've come to believe that uh, that modeling uh, is, an essential, is an essential ingredient uh, in how we come to understand systems, uh, uh, and particularly uh, uh, roles to play in how we formulate public policy. It seems to me one of the themes of, of this meeting so far, or one of the questions that's been hanging, uh, is how do we understand uh, uh, complexity? How do we understand complex evolutionary systems uh, of which we are a part? Uh, and how do we communicate that understanding. Uh, uh, this is a question that uh, my work over in both careers has, has been trying to address. Well, why is this an important question? Well, well first of all, uh, any decision process uh, by Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety says uh, the regulation that the regulator can achieve is only as good as his understanding of his understanding of the problem domain. Uh, it's fairly clear uh, that our understanding of many problem domains is not sufficient. Uh, therefore, we're in the mess uh, that our, our world is in. Um, there are a number of problems that have, have now been characterized as wicked problems. And these are problems for which we have found no solutions. That's why they're wicked problems. But these wicked problems have a number of characteristics. Uh, uh, first of all, it's not clear where the boundaries of the problems exist, uh, and there's a interdependence. Uh, so we think, well, climate is a, is a problem, but climate is a problem that's interdependent with distribution of income, with resource availability, and a whole bunch of other things. It's not a problem that can be uh, taken apart into little pieces uh, so that we can look, look at and find solutions to the, the pieces individually. Uh, and so that's one of the characteristics. One of the other characteristics uh, is that nobody owns, nobody, no institution owns the problem. Uh, uh, each, uh, each and every institution has some kind of role. The decisions that they make through the course of whatever they're doing are all decisions that collectively impact on, uh, uh, on, on the wicked problem. Uh, there's also a notion that wicked problems don't have solutions, so they don't lend themselves, as, as I've said, to breaking up into little bits and pieces where we can solve, where we can find a solution for each problem. Uh, by and large, wicked problems seem to in involve aspirations for system change uh, uh, and the uh, and there, there are no particular solutions. Uh, you can only think that there is a process that we might undertake uh, that will move the system towards our aspirations. Uh, that problems are, ca can't be ripped out and, and thought of as being uh, universal for which there are solutions. Um, by and large, uh, the human mind uh, by itself uh, is capable uh, only of dealing with cause-effect relationships that are local in space and time. That's probably the way that we learn even from infancy is that we you know, move our hand and something happens and we do that twice and we, and we learn there's a, a mental model impressed on us 
that that's the way the system works. Well, as problems got more complicated, uh, but we still regarded them as problems, we began to see that we needed uh, to develop tools uh, that would help us solve these problems. Uh, but by and large, we're still thinking in the mode of, uh, you know, here's a problem. Can we invent a system that will solve the problem more or less universally? And so all we have to do is press the button. The system understands the complicatedness that our mind can't grasp, and out comes a solution. Uh, so all in a way the policymaker has to do uh, is listen to the advice given by uh, his policy advisors, uh, typically a team of economists, uh, and they tell the policymaker what is the best solution. Uh, policymaker is given no real choice. Uh, the problem has been, been defined for him, the solution is given, all the policymaker has to do uh, is an enact the rules and regulations that will uh, bring about the solution. Well, this approach is, has proven to be inadequate uh, with respect to wicked problems. Uh, I, I guess I, I should have added along the way that it is the characteristic of wicked problems uh, 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 that they involve systems uh, whose future and, and whose structure is unpredictable. That's what evolutionary systems are about, are systems that, that evolve and change structure, and they do that uh, in unpredictable ways. So the problem we've tried to confront is how do you build models of systems uh, that keep on changing? Uh, and so uh, this uh, uh, is, is really uh, uh, a paradox. Uh, we can build models of systems that we understand, but can we build models of systems that we know we can't understand and, and that will continue to change? And the answer to that uh, uh, paradox, uh, we believe, is no, you can't. Uh, uh, but what you can do uh, is make use of the understanding that we have and put it in an open simulation model uh, that is, is transparent and accessible to everybody. Uh, uh, and, and, that, and with an emphasis on the word transparency. Uh, and basically then the notion of that model is not to provide answers to problems or solutions to problems. Uh, it's, it's to explore the problem space and, and to try and look at the opportunities for reconfiguring the underlying physical system such a way that it meets our aspirations for system change. Uh, one thing we can say for sure about, well, not even for sure, but by and large, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good bet uh, that in the year 2050 and beyond, uh, the laws of physics as we understand them, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, will hold. Uh, they're shown to be quite regular in our understanding of, of chemical and uh, material transformations uh, is by no means complete, uh, but we do understand what we know works. And so the future is not entirely open-ended, uh, it's bound uh, uh, by the physical laws and the understanding of the regularities that you know, science has, has been able to uncover. Uh, so it's our view that you can build simulation models that are open and transparent, uh, that let you explore the space uh, that's available given your understanding of uh, of chemical and biophysical laws. Um, but you have to then view modeling as a process, not as an object. The object is not a model that, that captures that. It is a process that keeps the, is open a, and adaptive uh, to new technology, if you like, new learning, new understanding as it becomes available. And as it becomes available, the space of opportunities opens up. Uh, we think that it, that is important that this kind of understanding, and you learn about systems by simulation, uh, those that we can't experience directly ourselves, uh, <coughs> you can begin to understand systems whose dynamics are slow or, or whose uh, uh, effects are distributed widely in space, 
you can only begin to understand those systems by simulation. And because they're full of nonlinearities and so on, there's no generalization. Uh, how the system responds uh, to particular disturbances is different at each moment in time and each, in some sense, place and space. And the way that you can begin to understand actually how that system works is to simulate. Keep on disturbing it, watch how it responds here, watch how it responds there, and gradually, by learning by experience, uh, you'll begin to understand uh, something of how that system works. Uh, uh, but as you then apply the sort of uh, process in a, in a policymaking environment, uh, then you have to use this kind of exploratory process to put options in front of the decision makers. So we can go down this trajectory or this trajectory or this trajectory and we can assess which ones, uh, uh, but it's not the modelers whose job it is to assess the trajectories. That's the job of a political process uh, to say, we prefer this pathway, even though we understand it might involve trade-offs here and there between this interest group and this interest group and so on, but that's a political process. So the job of the, of the modeling support is to open up the space of opportunities uh, and give the political process a chance to make real choices from amongst real possibilities. It's only then when the choices have been expressed uh, that the policymaker can then begin to dream about the policy instruments that might be employed uh, in order to put the system now, whose trajectory you know in a great deal of detail, how you put the system on that trajectory. Uh, uh, and so, this is, this is, this notion is very uh, counter to the way we do policy. Uh, by and large, at best, we, we have, coming out of the sort of current Newtonian world, uh, we have policy models that purport to be able to predict how humans are going to behave, how economic agents, including humans, are going to respond to some policy instrument in the year 2050 or beyond. Uh, that's preposterous, uh, uh, quite frankly. If, if there's one thing that we can say about, about human systems is that this is the focus of change and adaptation. It's change and adaptation in our behavior that, that you know, puts us in the Anthropocene. Uh, and so we, we intend in the kind of modeling that we do uh, to uh, not include representations of human behavior and how it will respond to policy. Uh, we think uh, uh, better still is, you know, choose the pathway, experiment with some policies, uh, and you'll know within a year or two or three whether or not your policies are effective. And when they're not, as they probably won't be, uh, because a number of things may have happened, then you get to change the intensity with which you apply the policies, or you try new policies altogether, uh, as the case may be. And then, of course, if, if you know, some, some interesting new technology comes along that would be interesting to be on a, on a chosen pathway, then you'll have to adapt again. So it's this kind of a adaptive process that we think. Where I want to go, and I'll end on this, uh, is that what I think is, is needed uh, is a platform, an open access platform, uh, on which models of this type, so these open-ended uh, exploratory models, uh, can reside such that they can be accessible to anybody and everybody from the platform and freely, so that anybody who is interested in playing out their particular scenarios can do so. Uh, uh, and we think that, that that open platform should be populated by a number of models at a number of different geographic scales and temporal scales. Uh, uh, people should have the capacity to add to the model base, if you want to call it that, and they should have the capacity to change models that exist and they should have the capacity to link various models together uh, because those are the components that are required for the space that they wish to explore. Uh, and I'll close with the idea that, that we, our little company, and my years as public service, 
have built versions one, two, and three of such a platform. Uh, and our little business is based on building models on that platform. Uh, versions four, five, and six are probably required. Uh, uh, but what we, we have found it difficult to do is to realize uh, open and free access. Uh, uh, it seems to me that that's going to require some kind of, of third party, uh, not for profit interest uh, in order uh, involvement to put that in place. There we are. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>